I'll start by telling you about a study we did. We, um, now many of you probably already participate in our science of variation group, but if you don't and you want to, um, please just email me and we'll, we'll send you to the sign up sheet. But what the science of variation group is, it's an international group uh, that uh, agrees to uh, answer a survey based experiment. It's not just counting how many people do a certain procedure or believe this or do that. It's uh, we randomize things, we show people different things uh, and we study what's going on with us. Uh, we try to figure out why we do things differently by looking at the impact of various uh, things. And long ago when we, when we had first started this, we wanted to answer the question, what do people do how do people decide when the evidence is equivocal? And I think that's true for a lot of things. So that covers a lot of things where you can have uh, really good randomized trials that show no difference. So for instance, um, a good example would be Tim Davis's uh, three-armed trial of trapezium metacarpal arthroplasty, no difference. So if you, if you let's, so we said, we've got 10 studies, we've got treatment A, treatment B, because we didn't want to say it was a certain diagnosis or a certain treatment because people have vested interests. They have emotional attachment to that. So we just said treatment A, treatment B, 10 randomized trials, there's no difference. How are you going to decide which treatment to use? And there was a list of things that you could rank, um, things like cost or, uh, potential harms, um, uh, how long it takes to do, things like that. And the things that, the things that rose to the top, and it was pretty clear, it was pretty unequivocal, were what I was trained to do and what works in my hands. So that just shows the, the anchoring that we, that we go with. And if, if, if the title the title is meant to be provocative, we're gonna rethink tonight. We're gonna to say, what if, what if evidence or maybe just a, a sort of fireside chat like this about what we do every day, what if that were, you know, if you had an open mind, would it potentially change what you do or would you understand what you do better? Or would you talk to patients differently? Um, so let's forget about what we were trained to do and let's forget about what we're comfortable doing at least for one hour and then see if we can be comfortable with discomfort, which I think is a very important aspect of enjoying life <laughs> and happiness. Okay, so we'll start with one that could probably take the whole hour and it's fine if it does because we're not trying to solve the problem of any one pathology or diagnosis. We're trying to understand what hand surgeons, what human beings that happen to be hand specialists do for a given patient with a given problem. So we'll start with carpal tunnel syndrome just because it's so rich, it's just a rich, rich topic. And I'll start with saying, is it a misnomer? <laughs> um, and this is where I want Carlos and Julia to, to chime in. So, I mean, syndrome is a collection of symptoms and signs that collectively um, form a diagnosis. And a lot of times we use the diagnosis syndrome, like uh, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Don't hear that much anymore, right? You hear HIV and you hear very quiet, like viral loads. And it, you know, think you've, it's very quantitative. It's down to the pathology. We know exactly what it is. But when we didn't know what it was, it was AIDS. It was a, a, immune, a, acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Now we still call it carpal tunnel syndrome, although we know that it's pathophysiology of the median nerve. So is it time to change that? Carlos, why don't you start off? Um, well, uh, I would say no, <laughs> because for me, if a patient comes with a group of um, symptoms and then he has some signs, for example, you know, I get pins and needles, pain in the hand, mainly in the thumb, index and middle, I get it at night, it wakes me up every night, makes life miserable, and my fingers go numb sometimes, and I tend to drop things. Um, uh, that, that I'm going to start looking for the signs of that, put it all together, and it's got carpal tunnel syndrome. 
No. Yeah, seismic, Tunnel, Phelan, yeah. Urkan. Yeah. Yep. If, 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 you believe, if you believe they're sensitive and specific. And then I don't know why that patient has got that. I really don't know the cause of it. But I know that if I put the steroid injection or I operate on them, they're likely to get better. Yeah, and so the syndrome, you, you've outlined this syndrome where you say there's a high probability that if I do something for the pathology of the median yeah. nerve at the carpal tunnel, that they're going to experience an improvement. Yes. Okay. And so, but are, in the end, is it, it's the, it's the idiopathic median nerve in the carpal tunnel that's the key, right? If, if you had carpal tunnel syndrome without that, they, and they responded to those treatments, it would be placebo or nonspecific, right? Because there's no pathology. Yeah. So it, it, isn't it ultimately about the pathology? Well, it, it, it is, but I, I don't fully understand the pathophysiology of carpal tunnel. And, and I'll give you an example that I'm interested in. And, and some, some members of the audience have studied this. And there is a subgroup that they probably got a type of amyloidosis and they, they deposit the protein around the nerve or maybe in the nerve um, and, and they get that. But, but that's a, a small percentage of it. Um, there, there, are, there are some others, for example, in the UK, is considered that exposure to vibration can give you carpal tunnel or precipitate the carpal tunnel. You know? and, and, and the causes are so varied and the, 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 the pathology is also so varied. For example, some patients have pain. Some patients don't have pain. So, so I'm not quite clear why, but it's, it's because of the different fibers, how they get involved. So when I think of carpal tunnel, the more I think, the more I realize that I know very little about it. Well, I hope when we're done, you'll feel more confident, but that was excellent because <laughs> you, you went to cause, which is the next thing on my list. But Julia, let's get you involved first. Um, what, what goes through your mind when you hear this symptom, sub subjective plus uh, objective or subjective response to objective um, maneuvers? So symptoms and signs. So there's a subjective side and then there's the objective side. You can measure the neuropathology. And I'm saying since we can measure the neuropathology, maybe we don't need the syndrome anymore. How do you react to that? Mm, I think the syndrome has other benefits, including communication with other healthcare professionals. Because perhaps carpal tunnel syndrome allows me to talk to other um, hands it's established. Yeah, it's sort of like yeah, a shorthand. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I suppose for me, I think there are a proportion of patients that do seem to have quite discrete symptoms and signs. And I think they will respond well to a carpal tunnel steroid injection and an operation. Um, so perhaps that little group, but there do seem to be a lot of other people that I know from sort of reading papers for yours, you know, like the pain that shoots up the arm and other non-specific things that can come with carpal tunnel syndrome that probably aren't related to the syndrome or at least the pathophysiology of the median nerve and sometimes respond to the treatments for carpal tunnel syndrome, which may therefore be a placebo effect. Um. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Yeah, so it, it's because of the, what I, what I think I'm hearing from both of you is the uncertainty and the limits of our current knowledge make it more comfortable to, to prioritize the subjective. Well, I think also because it describes, doesn't it, that when I have nerve conduction study results, if the story is very likely to be carpal tunnel syndrome, but the nerve conductions are normal, I might still offer a carpal tunnel steroid injection because it might make them better. <laughs> um, and then that doesn't seem to make sense if it's purely the pathophysiology of a compressed median nerve. All right. That's the third thing on my list. So we'll come <laughs> back to that one. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll go back to the cause. So yeah, this thing, this, uh, the newest thing is amyloid. And I think what we would say is, I'm talking about idiopathic median neuropathy, median neuropathy at the carpal tunnel. Now that's what we mostly treat, right? We sometimes treat acute carpal tunnel syndrome after a perilunator distal radius fracture. We sometimes treat carpal tunnel syndrome in association with a form compartment syndrome. Maybe somebody's uh, overdosed and laid on their arm. Um, we sometimes treat a carpal tunnel syndrome in the, se in the setting of rheumatoid arthritis, um, or you could say median neuropathy 
due to rheumatoid synovitis, you could say mean neuropathy due to swelling and bleeding around a disarrhagus fracture. Um, so those are non-idiopathic, but mostly we, we, we deal with idiopathic. Uh, amyloid comes along and says, well, maybe, maybe they're not idiopathic. Maybe it's due to amyloid deposition. And if you figure that out, you can save a person's life because you can diagnose and treat their heart. Mm. So that's pretty compelling. And in fact, the way that that comes at you, I think for many of us, is um, somebody in our community said, this, we've got to get this out there now. We've got to, I mean, every time somebody has bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, you should be biopsying the amyloid for amyloid. You know, and that, of course, anytime anybody says something like that, I get really nervous because um, we've heard these sort of things before and, and there is a risk to overtreatment. Um, I was really, I really enjoyed the study. Um, I think recently in Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, it was from the VA, I think in California or something. And they had a large number of patients and they looked at a probability calculator that uh, somebody would uh, develop amyloidosis and specifically cardiac problems. And they found that the chances were very low among everybody with carpal tunnel syndrome, but other factors could raise the probability, but they still weren't sure about, even with their probability calculator, the potential benefits and potential harms of of um, you know what the threshold was for actually biopsying for amyloid and making a positive uh, outcome versus um, a, a number of tests and treatments and interventions that might cause more harm than benefit. So I think you know I don't want to spend too much time on that, but it's it's not idiopathic. There are some things that we that it's it's something we could you know we could it could be a life saving potentially because cardiac amyloidosis is treatable. Uh, intervention, and yet it's not as easy as that. You, you still have to work through the, the experimental science of it. Um, let's go to, let's, and then the cause, of course, the, the whole thing about whether activities cause it. Um, I worry about that uh, without getting too much into that. I think the concern there is that the, the way our minds work, the human minds put things together that don't necessarily belong together. And um, it tries to make sense of the world. And if, for those of you who aren't familiar with Kahneman and Tversky's um, Nobel Prize winning 30 or 40 years worth of research, there's Kahneman still doing research. And in, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, the fast is the intuitive guessing part of your mind, which is really amazing and really useful. And the analytical part is the type two or slow and it's tiring and it's uh, difficult and takes some effort. Uh, but we need the, the analytical to, like science, to catch up or, or catch the errors in our, our fast, fast thinking. And um, yeah, so I, th I think being aware of, of, your, of your potential to put things together, it's really natural. And it's, you know, if you ask a patient, hey, why did you come in? Next time you go to the, when you go to the office tomorrow, hey, what brings you in? Listen closely for whether you get a very clear description of symptoms like Carlos provided. I get numb and these three fingers wakes me at night, a brace helps. Is it very descriptive or do they say, I type a lot? I've been overdoing it at such and such. Mostly you get interpretations. You know, don't take my word for it. Just see what happens tomorrow in the office. You mostly get interpretations because that's the way the human mind works, tries to make sense of things. And when you get a very clear description, which many people do give you, they do give you the fingers go numb, not the small finger. And you're like, oh, I got this carpal tunnel syndrome. You can listen closely. And if you get descriptive words, you're, you're at the diagnosis within 10 seconds. But a lot of times you're getting interpretations. And I think that shows the, where these associations come from because I'm sure vibration brings out the symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome. So therefore it seems like it causes it. And there's a number of cognitive biases involved there. But the reason we, we need a big, massive type two thinking, which is science, experimental science, to try to resolve that. And so far, science points to genetics, not environment or activity for idiopathic uh, median neuropathy at the carpal tunnel. So let's go to um, let's go to this idea that that unmeasurable disease could be important. I have trouble with that. I mean, can you think of any other disease that hand surgeons treat where that's true? Julia? Yeah. Cancer is true, right? Cancer, you do some screening and you figure out what's going on and you'd be happy you caught it before it was symptomatic or 
But is there, how much of that is, and, and I think carpal tunnel is that way to some degree as well, but, but uh, I'm not sure the unmeasurable, my argument would be that unmeasurable doesn't need any treatment. I can easily and often, and there's millions and billions of people walking the planet with carpal tunnel, idiopathic median neuropathy at the carpal tunnel so mild that, that they, they aren't seeking care. Is there anything else in hand surgery where we worry or care about or would treat minor levels of pathology? So maybe grade the, one CMC. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> maybe that's do we? I don't know. I mean, I used to call it the unicorn because we did a study looking for um, type grade one, and we just never seemed to find it. But um, yeah. well, some people treat laxity, right? Some people mm. take trapezium metacarpal laxity and symptoms that they ascribe to that and then do a ligament reconstruction. So I suppose that that counts. I think that one counts. Carlos, did you have a thought? No, no but just, just, just uh, going to say that Phil Greaves on the chat says radial tunnel, radial tunnel yeah. syndrome. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can't measure it. So, you know, do you treat it? Okay. Who, who feels comfortable treating something they can't measure? You know, you know, basically it's the scientific method. So can you objectively uh, verify your hypothesis that the symptoms are caused or related to or associated with pathology of the posterior nerve as it passes under the supinator? Um, oh, repetitive strain injury, CRPS, thank you. Now we're going, now we're talking. <laughs> Come on, keep it coming, keep it coming. Go, go, go. Uh, what do you guys... What are you, what's your fibromyalgia, thoracic outlet? Yeah. What's your fibromyalgia? You call it differently, right? Like, isn't it? No, 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 no. You call it, yeah, you just got a different fibro. name. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, it just yeah, it's all these... fibro, isn't it? Fibro. <laughs> what's your fibro pain like? <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that are unmeasurable. And that was a nice list that people offered up. And now, now we, now we start to realize, like some of the people on the call are like, I don't feel comfortable with those diagnoses. And other people on the call are like, oh, those are diagnoses I use every day. And that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm trying to get to the heart of here. So um, let me, let me get, let's keep going into why we might treat uh, unmeasurable median neuropathy at the carpal tunnel. We might even go so far as to do surgery, which has not just, surgery is an interesting treatment because it doesn't have just potential harms that need to be balanced with potential benefits. It's got actual harms. I mean, it's done with a knife. So like surgery is harm, that it's just, it is. And I think that's hard for surgeons to think about. I um, mean, even patients often forget that, but um, I would say, uh, you know, that there's a, every time you do a surgery, there's a potential harm that you have to balance with at least some benefit, some potential for benefit. Uh, so if, if they don't actually have median neuropathy at the carpal tunnel and you're releasing the carpal tunnel, you're probably not giving them anything but harms, which is a really difficult pill for me to swallow. It's, it doesn't feel ethical to me. So why might some people feel a lot more comfortable with that? And a lot of people do. Um, and I think it's due to, so this is my provocation. I don't know the answer. I'm gonna get Carlos and Julia to ask and everybody can chime in on the chat. I think it's because we, don't think of ourselves as treating pathophysiology. We think of ourselves as alleviating symptoms. So we don't think of the surgery as addressing idiopathic mean at the carpal tunnel or uh, in specifically pressure on the nerve, which is what transverse carpal ligament release addresses and seemingly successfully so. Um, no reason to doubt that and, and pretty good evidence. Um, but what we, we tend to think of ourselves as, as treating inability to sleep, inability to knit, inability to work, inability to play uh, the flute. Um, and so somebody says, you got to help me, you got to help me. And it sounds a little bit like carpal tunnel. So we operate on them. Um, Julia, do I, am I, do you think I'm on the right track or am well, yeah, I think it, it might also be societal because we've become quite a transactional society, haven't we? There's a problem and I need to fix it. And I think personality wise, surgeons have sort of gravitated towards that. I think 
if I could handle more ambiguity, I might have become a neurologist, but um, I've become a hand surgeon. <laughs> and I think I like to think that I help people and that when they have normal nerve conduction studies and some rather odd symptoms that might be carpal tunnel, if I give a steroid injection and they get better, then I made them better. Although my brain tells me that there's still, I could have injected almost anything and the theater around my injection was what helped them, my believing them, my listening to them. So I guess what I'm hoping is I can grow up to be the sort of person that can help them and listen to them without necessarily stabbing them. Yeah, and I think that's, I live in that world, but uh, yeah, I don't wanna necessarily dwell on that, which I love to talk about, but. It, it's a nice way that you put it, which is if my steroid injection truly is just helping a person bring out their own inner healer, which is to uh, have the endorphins and the serotonin and the dopamine, everything lined up so that they can accommodate the symptoms that they're getting, wherever the, whatever pathology there is causing them, um, then I'd rather do it without the shot and without the surgery. I, I think I would too. And I think it, most of us would because the shot has some potential for harm and the surgery is inherently harmful. Um, but putting that, putting that aside, um, Carlos, any other thoughts about, you know, I mean, let me restate. There's a part of it that sort of, we want to help, we want to help, we want to help and yeah. we feel good helping, right? But I heard yes. another thing in what you were saying, which is I feel bullied by the patient. I feel pressured and bullied. And I don't think that's a good reason to be doing anything. And if you feel that, then you ought to acknowledge it and find a way to, to you could just say that. You just say, I got, this doesn't feel right to me. You know, well, the, it's the, the, okay to talk about it. Go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, two, two, two comments from you. One, that there is an expectation. So, so people will come to a consulting room and what they expect, I think it's two things. They expect you to listen to them. They want a label for it. They want a diagnosis and they want a treatment. And if possible, immediate effect, easy treatment, right? So that's the expectation. And, 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 and we, we, we try to please people. We, we try to do what they expect. So, so there, is, there is a push towards that. And another interesting question that you raise is why do some surgeons operate more than others? And why oh, some of them do the more complex procedure, the more, the more hardest high state procedure. And that's something that I've thought actually. And um, there, are, there are a few studies in other specialties like max fax and dentistry. And amazingly, this is not related to knowledge or experience or ability or training. It only relates to one thing, which is your attitude to risk. And, and that's a personal thing. And I, and I don't think that is trainable. Right. So, so I see with our fellows, you know, you try to give them a balanced view of the world. I can't, you know, some of them will be very interventionist and some of them will not. And I'm not going to change them. <laughs> yeah, there's root values, right? That, that yeah. the patient and the specialist bring to the equation. And I think that's an important point that we forget is that we're not starting at the symptoms. We're not starting at the evidence. We're somewhere in the middle. We're in the middle because we've jumped there by our values. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to let somebody who has pushed, put all their hope in me leave empty handed. That's my, that could be my value. Yeah. And my value, and maybe Julia's is, I'm not gonna trick someone into getting well. And, and, and so you, it, you start at a certain place. And I, I don't know if we, um, I don't know if we talk about that enough. You know, For the Hand Society, we were putting together measures that we could hand surgeons could potentially use for a new healthcare law that was tying money to quality outcomes and trying to get into the quality era and as we were brainstorming what we would use we were of course facing the terrible evidence and the difficulty saying what's right or wrong but we could just say what who's an outlier in rates and i said well, why don't, where are we starting we can't start in the middle because we'll like here's an example we started with is tennis elbow enthesopathy of the ECRB origin, is that uh, work-related? Now, if you, if you look up the data on that, you're starting in the middle because you're, you're reading occupational medicine doctors mm -hmm. who believe it is related, doing experiments which are crappy and likely to prove themselves right. And so if you look at the evidence, it says, yes, 
but there's no studies from people like me who are super skeptical and concerned about these things and doesn't doesn't want to say anything's related to anything without very strong proof because of how it reinforces misconceptions, very common misconceptions that are known to make people less healthy. And so we do need to know what our principles and our values are. And we might even stop and say, uh, well, I actually may not have been aware of a value that I've long held and I put aside in my training because I had to survive to do it. I was experiencing too much moral injury by holding on to my value uh, that we, sh for instance, that we shouldn't operate on normal electrodiagnostic tests. Um, that, that, that just didn't make any sense to me, but I was habituated to it and drifted over to it because I was really suffering morally. And maybe if you stop and look and you say, I don't, I still suffer a little bit morally and I lost a bit of myself when I had to put that aside. Let me go back to my value of not exposing people to potential harm unless there is a definite potential benefit. So I think the values really do matter. But one thing I was going to say is that um, sometimes it's worth exploring what the patient was worried about. Because um, there was a really interesting study from Derby where they looked at dorsal wrist ganglions and followed them up. And one of the things they were worried about was, was it something dangerous? And for a lot of them, if we said it wasn't dangerous, you know, it glows in the dark, it's just a ganglion, it doesn't represent any damage to anything, um, then, th then a lot of them were happy that that was it and they didn't feel the need to have it cut out. Um, yeah, those, those are, you know, I'm thinking about the, I was thinking this morning that I should probably refer to my talks and my uh, my assessment of the evidence in terms of population health, because that's what I was, that was what was on my mind um, when Carlos said, they come to you yeah. with this expectation. And like, that's not correct. Like, <laughs> you know, how many times has somebody been sent to you to have their ganglion removed when the ganglion is obviously a somatic focus? for some very big events that are going on in their lives and, and some symptoms of anxiety or depression that are undertreated or, and some important misconceptions they have about that bump on their wrist. And the, if, if, if the whole health system understood this, and I know people like Nick Aresti in the UK are trying to work on sorting this out, but if the whole, if the whole system understood this, then those patients would never be sent to you. They'd be sent to you after the misconceptions were gently reconnect, reconnect, corrected, re redirected, after the symptoms of anxiety and depression were alleviated, after they're uh, about to get evicted, um, gonna lose their job, getting divorced, just lost a family member was resolved and they've had their social security back and their social health restored. And they, and they said, yeah, look at this thing, it's ugly. I want that out, I'd rather have a scar. Because that's what ganglion surgery is, it's, it's aesthetic yeah. surgery. Um, and let's get, let's, you know, it's just good because we're talking about ganglions, trapezium metacarpal arthrosis. Um, let's let, there's something about carpal tunnel that relates to ganglion. Another thing I want to get to. So if, if somebody comes in and says, I'm, you know, what brings you in today? I'm waking up at night every with excruciating pain. I'm waking up with excruciating pain. I'm not I'm thinking carpal tunnel, but the next question I'm asking is, do you also have tingly fingers? So I think, I, I think we could maybe agree tonight, let's see, see we'll, we'll look at the chat, we'll look at you two, that pain alone, without any tingling, no paresthesias of any sort, pain alone without any paresthesias is never carpal tunnel syndrome. Julia nodded, no, no chat erupting. <laughs> so wouldn't it be nice if we could agree on that? If we could agree on that, we would be able to just Okay, we're putting that when carpal tunnel is not on the list yet because I got no paresthesias and we're going to we're going to work in some other direction. And if with a ganglion cyst, the way that would be formulated is the only pain that I can uh, ascribe to the ganglion cyst for dorsal one is is push up pain is extension, forceful extension pain. That's the one that's the one that hurts when you have a dorsal ganglion. It doesn't hurt to type it doesn't hurt to. You know, and that's Joe Diaz's work showed that as well. Like, you know, most of those people didn't have pain. Our, our study showed the same thing. Most people either had no pain or very little pain. They just had a funny looking wrist. And when they do have pain, it's, it's due to that very specific movement. So I think if we can simplify that for ourselves, then what we can do is we can simplify it 
for non-specialists and we can simplify it for the lay public. And all of a sudden things start to get easier. And, and then what, what comes to the specialist looks a lot different because there's not, what happens right now is we say, uh, smart people like Carlos say, I'm getting dumber about carpal tunnel syndrome, which we all feel like we are whenever we go to see the next latest lecture or the latest technique. We also start to you know, doubt ourselves. And so we let this complexification or obfuscation in, and then we use that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to be a little bit cynical here. We can use that to create our, a need for ourselves. You need a specialist because only we can understand it. And then you make the primary conductor or, or your family practitioner GP feel scared to do anything with it because we've already made it way too complex and uh, way too obscure for them. So that's a little bit of soapbox, but it's, uh, I think it's worthy of consideration that there is a value of keeping things very simple. And I think we can. Um, some interesting things have come up on the chat, uh, which I thought was interesting to discuss. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that worry about having access to psychological help. Um, I think people worry that they'll open up this Pandora's box by asking about anxiety and depression and then leave them nowhere to go. And if someone then does tell you about marital, break, marital breakdown, financial problems, work problems, and, and it's related to this dorsal risk ganglion, then where do you go from there? So people are saying that they feel like psychiatric referrals often are rejected until an organic cause is excluded, whereas actually, you know, the dorsal risk ganglion was never going to be the source of that. Um, yeah, and I, I, I advise people, well, I say think two things. I, when I was in Boston, I had a psychologist, Anna Maria, who you were working with, Julie, in my office. And in, in, in Austin, I have a social worker. But that does not solve your problem because you can still offend people by over uh, emphasizing it. And so what I always say is you have to wait to be, you have to, they have to ask for it. They have to request it. So from a specialist, from me, the specialist, that no one ever sees a social worker or a psychiatrist unless they ask you. And I don't, and I, I don't, I, the, so the, the formula is this, this is the formula that we can use worldwide, anywhere you are, whatever your situation is. And we need that because we want to be able to do the right thing tomorrow morning. And here's the formula. You're the specialist. You're not the GP. So it's the GP, it rests with the GP, the GP, the whole health of the person dental, mental, social, the whole health of the person. That's what a GP is. They're the, they're the person that organizes a person's health. You're the arm specialist. You may be the only one who can say, there's more symptoms here than I would expect for this issue. Uh, there's more limitations. There's more incapability than I would expect. Nobody else is gonna have confidence to do that because we've trained them to be not confident. So they're relying on you. So what you do when you patient comes to you, you say, there's something here. And you say it to yourself in your head. And if you, if you practice it, you can say it to the patient. You can say something like, wow, this has been so hard. How do you do it? You know, it's like an affirmation as well as a compassionate inquiry. You can say, wow, this is, this is really throwing you off. Um, or just say, tell me more about that. What's, and and you, if you take a genuine interest in the things that are that are cluing you in, the verbal and nonverbal aspects of their uh, description of their illness, that are cluing you into the mental and social health opportunities. If you take a genuine interest in that, and you can start by taking a genuine interest in them, right? Say, you know, I can't function at work anymore. Well, tell me about work. What do you do? Oh, that's really cool. Tell me more. I never knew anything about that. I mean, I'm, I learned so much about different jobs just by doing that. It's really fun doesn't take long. And then you start to gain trust. And then when you show an interest in what's going on in their whole life, you might even, they might even shed a tear. They might even shed a tear. And the, the, the residents always roast me. They say the top 10 we, ways that Dr. Ring makes his patients cry. But the thing is when somebody cries with you, I am so honored by that because it means they're comfortable with you. It means they trust you. You know what happens when they don't trust you, they yell at you, you have to call security, then there too. And so when they're crying, they're being vulnerable and it's a special moment. And so in that moment, you can say, 
get it all out, hand them a tissue, be a nice person. And then you can say, who's your support? And then you start, they might say, I don't have anybody. Or they might say, it's my family, my husband, but you know, he doesn't understand. Would you like some support? Yes, I would like some support. Ah, there it is, the request. There's the request. M Mr. or Mrs. GP, <laughs> I've got a request and I don't know what to do with it, but I'm sure you do. And here's what's going on with the ganglion. That can wait. It should wait. And, it, and I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. And let's work together on this comprehensively. So that's how you resolve that. And then, David, I can give you an example from today. I've been in clinic all day today. And I've had a, a lady refer with a non-union of a scaphoid, which is proven radiologically. Yep. Uh, but she had a lot of pain, like too much pain. And the history didn't meet things. So she came in and said, look, uh, I, I've read all your notes, but I want to start from the beginning. Uh, and I want to know why is this so painful and it's having such a big impact on you. And um, I've read the mechanism of the injury that something fell on the wrist, but uh, uh, that doesn't fit to me. I would like you to rethink that and tell me what happened. And then she, she started to get a bit emotional and said, no, I, it wasn't that really, but I didn't say anything because it was my partner who beat me and stamped on my wrist. Mm -hmm. And then that uh, uh, led to a, a splitting from the partner. And because the wrist has been painful, had an operation, but didn't heal. She couldn't work. She lost her job. She had to leave the house. She's on income support and struggling to pay the rent in the new place. He's got a young child to look after. And then everything came out. <laughs> and you realize that she's in a very difficult position. I mean, the scaphoid is one part of it. Uh, but 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 not all that. And as you say, you know, one day trust you, they see you are interested. They tell you the whole story. And what you see is that there is a lot of anxiety and distress linked to the scaffold, but not caused by the scaffold. That was a brilliant example. Thank you for that, Carlos. Yeah. And I, and, and I feel proud of you. And so I hope you feel pride in the fact that she, you gained her comfort. And, and many clinicians before did not. And she wasn't sure that it was okay to talk about that, but you made her feel safe to talk about it. And I'll tell you something, the evidence that talking about it makes it easier, strong. And the evidence that writing about it, writing about 15 minutes a day about the emotions of what you're going through is helpful, very strong. So you, you've already sort of started her on a, on a good direction. And there's an important part that comes up with your particular story, which we can we can get into because it's kind of, it's sometimes part of carpal tunnel. So I guess it's part, part of a lot of things. And she's got the idea that because her wrist is not healed properly and be, more, more so because it hurts because hurt always feels like something you shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. Hurt feels like something that's making the problem worse to every human alive or you're not work, your system's not working properly. And it's hard to rethink that. And so she's probably stuck on that thought. Those thoughts get more sticky when you're under a lot of stress and, distre and distress. That's what the evidence shows. I think, Julia, you're probably on one of those papers, moderation mediation papers. It shows that the, that the anxiety and the depression make the thoughts stickier. So you see people every day that have terrible thumb arthritis and couldn't care less because you, know, you just grab their thumb and crackle, crackle, but they're there for a trigger finger or a broken finger. And so people accommodate things very well, but not when they've got a misconception about it and particularly not when that misconception is reinforced by uh, all of the social stressors and anxiety and depression and despair and worry that you've, you've described. And so that's what's creating that disproportionate symptom. And we still got a scapegoat and onion to take care of at some point, but there's no, we got time, we got space and we got do it as a team. And there were some interesting things that people were talking about yeah. on the chat and the Q and A. And I wonder if it'd be worth looking at some pragmatic things, because I know a lot of your papers have looked at ways to spot people who are in trouble, um, you know, like the hand positions, the quite abnormal hand positions, the words that people use, um, you know, things, and like, like um, uh, I've got a high pain threshold because we're not listening to them. Mm -hmm. And I wonder whether those things would be quite useful to discuss and see if people think about that, because they're ways of yeah, well, spotting I'm, I'm, people I'm, in trouble. 
I'm feeling, I'm having mixed feelings about the discussion going this way. This is, this is one of my favorite thing to talk about. And yet, um, I, and I want you to all notice that we ended up here. Maybe some of you watching are probably thinking, I wish we didn't end up here. Uh, but the, uh, what I will tell you is this, you all know how to do this. You, you are all excellent at sensing the patient's unhelpful thoughts and worry and despair. And how do I know that? Why am I saying that so confidently? We did a study, which you, was you published in the last year in CORE. Uh, Seth Leopold is a great editor, publishes all the best stuff. Uh, don't, don't forget to look at what's in CORE. What we did is we took a camera, a GoPro, and we pointed it at the clinician's face, at my face. And it was easier to get approval for that than pointing it at the patient's face. And we were just playing around with this software that measures the emotions you're feeling based on your facial expression. And it measured all different types of emotions. And then we measured the patient's unhelpful thoughts, worst case thinking, fear of painful movement, uh, negative pain thoughts. And we measured their levels of anxiety and their levels of despair. And it turns out that there's pretty good correlations like 0.4 to 0.6 of your facial expressions and their mindset. So you are reading them accurately. You may not be aware of it. That's the thing. You may not be aware of it. And this is the thing you get in these survival habits to get through the day. And you're like, I don't, not that again, or well, that's going to be tough. Um, and so you push it aside. But if you, if you learn how to lean into it and say, there's something here, I'm, this is, this has been hard on you. It's, it's been very, it's, it's unsettling. Just kind of state something. Don't ask, are you worried about this? Don't do that. That's the worst thing to say. Say, say this, is, this has been tough for you. Just say it. And then they can say, no, it's been fine. So that's a motivational interviewing technique is a complex reflection. Interpret what they're saying, period at the end of the sentence. Let them correct you. That's not offensive. And it gets you where you want to go. So be confident that you are an excellent detector of unhelpful thinking, worry and despair and insecurity or social health. You are an excellent detector of that. And add to that skill, maybe you can let that make, you know, be, get a sense of your meter going up. Like you, I was taught when I was learning how to be a better communicator because I'm a surgeon and I'm a crap communicator at, at you know, by default and still trying to get better. But I was taught to, to notice the meter going to yellow and then to red as I got into a place that I was not gonna be any use like resentment and um, you know feeling disrespected and whatever I was feeling or frustration that just is not gonna be helpful to anyone. So you feel this going up, like something's going on here. This is not going well, be self-aware of it. And then you can look for or listen for words like unbearable, excruciating, uh, I can't even lift a coffee cup. I can't even tie my shoes, things like that. So that's, and then you look for the nonverbals, which is if you ask somebody to make a fist and they bend their wrist, we, they get in their own way. If you ask somebody to um, uh, bend the injured PIP joint and they straighten the other fingers, they, they get in their own way. And they're trying to protect themselves, probably unconsciously. Um, my favorite nonverbal is the arm in a box. So the arm that comes like it's detached and they, they'd like to give it to you and say, have this ready for me by five o'clock on Friday, please. Um, and you can say like, you say, I'm noticing something. I'm noticing how you hold your hand. I've seen this before. How, how do you describe to me how it feels? And a lot of times people will say like, this is not my arm. My arm isn't swollen. My arm does what I want it to do. Um, you know, so people feel actually feel detached from their arms. So this is the way that human illness experience goes and you can detect it. You are detecting it. You're good at detecting it. And you can verify it by looking at what they say, listening for what they say and looking at what they do. And then you'll be certain that something's going on and only empathy, only empathy, noticing, compassionate inquiry. You don't need to tell them the evidence. You don't need to name it. You don't need to do anything. You just need to show that you care about them as a person. And hopefully you've already taken an interest in them as a person. And you know that they've got a child at home and they're a single mother. And you know that what job they do and what they're, you know, maybe a little bit about what they're missing out in terms of avocations. And 
then they know that, that you actually care about them, then they trust you, and then that you show a little compassion. And if you don't do it perfectly, they'll forgive you. This is what I was taught. You, you put a deposit in the emotional bank account. So those are a few tips on, on, on you don't have to take it all on, GP is standing right, ready for you. Um, and you don't have to be a master communicator. You just have to be self-aware and, and make some noticing statements with compassion. And don't fear it taking time. This will save you endless time. What takes a lot of time is arguing. So if you say, it's this, and they say, no, it's not. Retreat to empathy immediately. Do not engage because you will never, in the, dis in the debate between a person's lived reality or their narrative, inner narrative, and your expertise, your expertise will lose every time. I don't care how right you are. So it doesn't matter that you're right. It's, it matters whether you're gaining their trust. So that's something about, you don't, and you don't have to do it all in one visit. That's another thing. I'll, I'll end on that. Don't feel like you have to solve this all or even have a really good relationship with the patient at the end of 15 minutes visit. You don't. You can set up the next one and maybe do emails and stuff and you know, find other ways to, to interact with the particularly difficult ones. But there's a, there's a certain set of patients that gets to us that's basically in the middle of very severe anxiety that's under treated or under diagnosed. And that's the one that's gonna, you're gonna get nowhere quickly. You've got to find an exit strategy. You've got to team up with the GP and, and find a way to make your day less um, uh, demoralizing while also really helping that person. We've just got a short bit of time left. Maybe I'll just go through a, a quick rundown of some things and then leave a few minutes for discussion at the end. Um, the, some of the things that, that lead to our debate, some other, I'm just gonna kind of run down some things that lead to us debating about things. And I, I think debate, but there's still plenty of room for debate and I like these things and thanks for all the interaction and, and the chat. Uh, but one of the things is natural history. And I want to make sure that everybody understands that. So natural history is what happens to these disease when you don't treat it. So I'm not talking about the symptoms now. I'm talking about the median neuropathy at the carpal tunnel. So what's the natural history of idiopathic median neuropathy at the carpal tunnel or carpal tunnel syndrome? And, you know, think about that for a minute. I think a lot of us write and talk as if it goes away. But the evidence, hard to prove, but the evidence, you know, if you have it on one side, you're likely to have it on the other. If it's severe on one side, it's likely to be more severe on the other side. They're kind of related in how severe they are. Um, most, most people that get it on one side eventually get it on the other. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of data, it's hard to prove, it's not definitive, but there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that it's always bilateral and it progresses gradually that the anatomy is the problem and the pressure on the nerve. And the only thing that's gonna get rid of that is surgery. So think about that. I think that's where a lot of the debate comes. Like if I give the steroid shot and they're better then they're cured, or if they, they deliver the child and they don't have the numbness anymore, they're never gonna have a problem again. Not true, they'll be back in 10 years. And you wanna make sure they know that so they don't come back with permanent nerve damage. We've talked about the role of steroids and Julia's concern that it's nonspecific effects that are making them better. I have the same concern. Um, we, we need a, a few more trials of placebo injection, but what's there? shows that if there is an effect, it's very temporary and there may not be any effect at all. But the quality of the trials yet is, is yet to be determined. So hanging a lot on the steroid injection is not, not too worthwhile. And I'll tell you this, there's, talk about variation. Most of the people I hang around never use steroid injections. And, and, and a lot of people use it routinely, but most of the people like in, in my practice in Boston, Jesse Chai Sang, none of them use steroids. In my practice, uh, in my colleagues in Austin, I don't know anybody who routinely uses steroids. I know some people selectively use it in somebody they're trying to figure out, but nobody routinely uses it. So there's a lot of variation in that, um, which, is a, which is always a key. If you see a lot of variation, that's a clue that there's probably, uh, in, we're maybe may misinterpreting what's going on. Maybe more room for rethinking, more experimental evidence. Um, you know what, I'm gonna do, Two more thing, two more uh, thoughts. One is after a carpal tunnel release. So I do carpal tunnel release in the office now, under local anesthesia with epinephrine. Um, assuming you do it the same way too. Do you give opioids in the UK? Not as much as the US, to be honest. But you do sometimes. Occasionally. Mm -hmm. How do you decide? 
Uh, I let my anesthetist decide. To be <laughs> Aha, you defer. Julia, what about you? Um, usually it's a discussion with the person. Uh, and the problem is if they're already on opiates before, they generally end up on opiates afterwards. They feel like the added pain of me making a hole in them requires some added analgesia. So this gets into a whole other area that, that that's tricky. And, you know, please do not, I know the UK is using more opioids, cut it out, stop it, you know, immediately. Um, so if you want tips and tricks for safe and effective alleviation of pain and optimal opioid stewardship, I direct you to the AAOS pain alleviation toolkit. And one of the tips that'll give you there is make practice wide maximum amounts. That way you can depersonalize the discussion. I wish I could give you more, but it says right here, I can't. Let's talk about what we can do. It works unbelievably well. <laughs> and so for me, the level of opioids you can have after a carpal tunnel is zero. And a lot of people in the US are at that point. Some people are even doing it for shoulder and knee scopes. And we're starting to become more like the Netherlands and what the UK used to be. <laughs> so follow our lead now <laughs> to get away from opioids. It's mostly about readying people for surgery and, and setting fixed upper limits and preparing them uh, for, for their recovery. Um, so I just wanted to get that out because I want to interrupt the, uh, any of our um, worldwide exporting of our shenanigans. And then one more thought that I, that I think about a lot, and we don't have time to discuss it too much, but maybe we have a little bit, is when, if, if, when there's something that everyone gets, something that's almost universal, like presbyopia or gray hair. And for us, it's trapezium metacarpal arthritis, or if you do arms like shoulders like me, rotator cuff tendinopathy. So what, why is that important to me? I think a lot of people say, ah, who cares? You know, somebody comes in, they're hurting, I'm gonna help them. Here's, I'm trying to express why this is so important to me. If there's something that everyone gets, we don't need to do any studies to know that most people are accommodating it. Now we have done studies and we've shown that people do come in with incidental trapezium metacarpal arthritis and they're managing it well. And it's because they have effective thinking about it and they don't have much distress. So there is, we can see that although we need better studies. But if, if you agree with me, you may not agree with me that most people are accommodating knee arthritis, thumb arthritis and shoulder tendinopathy, that sets up, I think, a moral imperative. I think that sets up the moral imperative that everyone deserves ac equitable access to accommodation. So if a lot of people are able to accommodate and some are not, we don't want to cheat them out of accommodation. So like, what if I told you that I'm not gonna tell anybody from Spain about how to accommodate symptoms. I'm, they're, 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 I'm gonna make sure that they suffer and then I'm gonna operate on them you'd probably be like, no way, you can't discriminate against people from Spain. You know, but I'm telling you, we should not discriminate against people with symptoms of anxiety. We should not discriminate against people with unhelpful thoughts or a lot of cognitive fusion. And so for me, it's become a real moral dilemma. I'm not asking you to, you know, you, you all search your soul and decide whether that works for you to have a better day at the office and feel like you're doing good work, but that's personally what I need to do. And so I'll leave it, I'll leave my comments at that and let you guys comment and, and wrap, wrap it up. I was just, just going to make a comment on, uh, you, you talked about tennis elbow, lateral epicondylitis. And uh, one of my trainers, Peter Lan, many years ago, used to tell patients that this is part of life. That's how life goes. And, and usually people in their, I don't know, 50 year old or whatever. And, and he used to say to them, we see lots of people your age with this problem but we don't see really old people. So they, they all get better or they all die from it. <laughs> and I, I, think, I, think, a little I, humor. I think they get better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I used to say something similar. You know, it, it's tempting to use a little humor, a little dark humor or, um, yeah, I used to do that too. But I, you know, when some people there, this is such a serious problem to them yeah. that you really, you have to legitimize why they're there. You have to normalize what they're going through. You have to connect with them on a compassionate level. And I, I never think that I can guess who's going to be okay with a joke or who's, yeah. who, what's really brewing down deep 
you can't guess what's what's going on. I wish I could. I could. I've told you some clues, but it's not perfect. So I always treat everybody as if this is I, something that I I need to be just as serious about as they are. Yeah. You know, occasionally, a patient will feel that you are belittling their their huge problem and you're not taking it seriously, and then you lose them if that, if that, if that yep. happens. Yeah. Yeah, it's trivializing. They feel, yeah. you know, like when I say something's age related, I try not, I try to describe it in a, in a, I try to connect with it and get to yeah. that without saying, but if you just say, this is just age, this is just age related, it yeah. trivializes what they're going through. And it's weird because you think you're giving good advice, but it's, it, it's all about that experience of being ill and feeling hopeless and feeling losing your identity and losing your role. And you can't, that's not something any of us would ever trivialize, trivialize. And a lot of you have probably experienced it yourself. So I think it's always best to remember why they're in their office. They're in their office because they're losing their identity. They're losing their role. They're, they have worry and they have fear. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Julie, I don't know if you want to have a look at or, or comment to any of the, of the questions that we have. Um, uh, uh, a, a lot of them uh, in the Q&A. Um, yeah, we've got quite a number of questions that will sort of <laughs> thoughts about um, how you need a longer consultation. I mean, I think I would agree with their saying that you can't fit things into five minutes, um, but I think very few of us have to fit a consultation into five minutes. I think we generally have longer um, but I, I think in your experience, you don't have to, it doesn't have to take 45 minutes for every person, does it? it... Well, there's no value to it. I can tell you that uh, when I was uh, uh, pre, you know, there, there's this Mar Marlowe's, uh, uh, or Maslow, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and then there's Maslow's um, theory of competence. And you start with unconscious incompetence. That's most of us, yeah. like, and that was me for sure. Like, I thought, if you say, hey, are you a good communicator? I'm definitely, I'm a friendly guy. People <laughs> like me, you know? And the truth is, I was a terrible communicator because I would uh, tell people what I wanted to say in the way that I wanted to say it at the time I wanted to say it and not worry about what they were actually going to hear. And it's not about what you say. It's only about what they hear. So I was a terrible communicator. I learned that I was, I became consciously incompetent and I knew how important it was. We Look, we ended up on that topic. It always ends up here in any useful medical discussion. It ends up on how do you talk about it? How do you communicate it? And so I became you know, consciously incompetent. And the thing that I, 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 I realized is you, you get that meter going to red, you feel it, you do your best. Um, if you're in the room for longer than 15 minutes, you're probably digging your own grave. There are a few, there are a few exceptions to that. One exception would be somebody with a work claim that's like a year old. They have to tell you about every injustice they've suffered and that can take an hour. Um, but the average person coming in with a new problem and you're the first specialist they've seen, it's, it's, gonna, be, it's gonna be quick. Now, if it's not quick, you're learning something about this patient. So what you wanna do is you wanna say, I want, I didn't leave enough time for this, or I really want to spend more time with you. I want to draw them in, draw them in, use, figure out your exit strategy. My exit strategy is, you know, this is, I've given you so much to think about, and I can see a lot of it's just not what you're expecting, which is pretty, pretty common. And I'd like to give you a chance to think about it. Then I'd like to continue this discussion. Would you like to continue discussion by email? I love email because it's less intrusive. I, I can do it on my time. It's asynchronous. And I can be very thoughtful about what I say. Now they can't see my, they can't hear my tone of voice and they can't see my face. So there's that, you gotta be very careful about what you put down into words, but it's the asynchronousness of it and the, the be able to be relaxed before you press send and maybe even wait till the next morning is, is brilliant and, and I make good use of it. Patients almost never email me when I offer it. So it's not a burden, um, but it could be a phone call. It could be another visit in a week uh, or two, uh, whatever works for you and your system. But if you can get those three or four patients in a clinic day that are, you get to the end of 15 minutes and you've gotten nowhere and get them incrementalized as Alto Guande would call it, spread that out over time, then you're going to have a better day. And we, we've studied timing of visits many, many times with audio recordings and stopwatches. And we're mostly at the same time measuring satisfaction, empathy, psychological factors. And we have very short visits. We've clocked one minute visits 
And that's, you know, that's the kind where somebody's usually, I, I remember one person came in, she had crushed her finger in uh, around here, pico de gallo, like a salsa machine. So it crushes the vegetables and she, but it was three weeks ago. And she's like, I, you know, it's pretty good. And the nail's starting to grow back. I just thought I ought to show it to you. And I was like, pico de gallo machine, tell me about that. Um, I didn't know there was such a thing, you know, got that in. And then, and then I said, yeah, it's definitely fine. You know, like it's not, there's, I don't even think we need an x-ray because there's no instability in the bone and you've, you're recovering great. It looks good. Okay, see you later. And I know that it was less than two minutes because we have this video that the patients have to watch um, to introduce. We have an unusual practice style where we have social workers and dietitians and PTs and we want them to know that people might be coming in. And that video takes about two minutes. I came in when the video was still playing and I was like, oh, you know, might as well get started. And I left before the video was done. <laughs> and it was, and, and she and I both had a great visit. So you know that a lot of visits happen like that. And when they can't happen like that, that's your red flag. That's your system to say something more is here and don't feel like you have to solve it. Oh, here's my thing. So one of the things that coach, my coaches gave me, one of my coaches over the years gave me was because I get wound up and I want to solve everything. Patient wants me to solve it. I want to solve it. Sound familiar? Surgeons tend yes. to be like that. And so what I say before I go into each room to, to reset myself from the last patient and get ready for the next is soothe, not solve. In other words, relationship first, the medicine will take care of itself. There's nothing pressing here. I'll figure out the medicine one day, maybe today, maybe some other day, but I, I need to emphasize the relationship. I need to soothe. They're here for some peace of mind. I need to make sure we connect with that. Thank you. And, and another thing that's sort of been, been saying, people have been saying is, um, you know, with surgery works, steroids work, let's, you know, let's do them. Um, and I was wondering about, um, making decisions that are consistent with the patient's choices. Because I know that you could offer de Quervain's release, for example, if they want an immediate or near immediate resolution of their symptoms and just crack on with life. So it's not that you don't want to offer surgery to anybody. It's just they have to be consistent with their values. Is that right? Yeah, and de Quervain is a good example. So. Um... Uh, people think of me as somebody who's very uh, reticent to offer surgery, but I, I'll offer surgery for someone with the querving the moment I, you know, as soon as I know the diagnosis and we have a talk. Same with trigger finger. I don't make them go through a couple of steroid injections because I'm not sure I would want to wait two months and see if it worked and then two months again to see if it worked. Um, so it's on the table. Every treatment is always on the table and that's part of, of, of giving the patient some agency. I will also tell you that if you describe to Quervain accurately, consistent with best evidence, it's a self-limited condition. People don't understand that, but I'll show you the data if you want. It's pretty good data. We could do better. We could do better, but it's pretty good. And um, so I say, this goes away. It takes about a year. It's, it's frustrating, but um, if you can wait it out, it'll leave. Uh, steroids, we try them, but to be honest, nobody's ever proved that they work better than simulated steroids. And I've had people say thank you and people be very disappointed. You can maybe give that a go. Only downside is a little skin discoloration potentially, and that may be temporary. And then there's surgery and we make a little cut and it's not a quick fix because you got to heal up the cut. I've certainly had people get mad at me for how long it took that cut to feel right. So it's not an easy way out. There's no easy way out, but it does tend to take care of the problem. And once the wound's healed, you'll feel better. Um, what would you like to hear more about? And I mean, I do like one or two Duquervain releases a year and I'm the one that's offering it the day they come in. And I do almost no steroid injections because a lot of times when somebody, I can see somebody doesn't really wanna, they really just want the thing to go away. Like you were saying, Carlos, they're just like, what's the option where it's gone by the time I leave this office? And I can tell that they believe that the shot will do that. And I am not ethically, I'm not gonna, be able to ethically let them leave with that misconception or act on that misconception. So I gently try to reorient it. And if I find that that's not going anywhere, I say, I might need a little chance to think about this because it doesn't feel right to me. And I'm not sure ethically that I'm ready to do this injection 
the way we're talking about it right now, would you be willing to give me a week or two to get comfortable with this and have you get, have a good think on it and then come back? And I don't, I don't ever rarely have to do that, but usually it's somebody with a lot of anxiety that's really pushing me and I just really don't feel comfortable with it. So, you know, maybe you're not, you're listening to me and how I manage these things and it may be different than what you do, but it's not often that you hear a hand surgeon talk about my own internal struggles, my moral dilemmas and my ethical mind. And so hopefully that's useful to some of you in kind of formulating how you want to navigate these waters. But I, did, I offer trigger finger and Dequervain at the get-go, but, and a lot of people choose to, uh, trigger finger release. I say, for that one, I say, I think the evidence is about 50-50 on the cortisone shots um, and maybe a little bit better than that. And you have to wait two months to see if it's gonna work. Uh, now you can say there may be a slight greater infection risk if you operate too soon after steroid injection. Not sure that's true, but there's some, some data. But that, that's, that's the steroid injection route. And the surgery injection route is, a, the surgery route is a quick procedure under local and it cures it, but you gotta heal up that, that tender scar. And that doesn't stop being tender for a while. And people, I've seen people get stiff. And uh, of course there's some risk of infection potentially needing another surgery. And there's a nerve there that I could once in a while injure. And um, so with that laid out like that, it, people basically formulated into, I can't wait for this to get better, do surgery, or I can wait, I'll have a cortisone injection. So that's, that's my biased way or my idiosyncratic way of presenting that. And um, I do a lot of trigger finger re releases just right off the bat. I suppose, yeah, the thing is, is making sure that their decisions match with what they think rather than any misconceptions they have about or might have about surgery or steroids. Um, so it's a not- A lot of times people are choosing their expressed preferences are in line with their misconceptions. And that only makes sense. So you have to identify that and make sure that you reorient those misconceptions before you make a final decision. Otherwise, now I'll put this in a quality and safety realm as well. Otherwise you may be misdiagnosing you may be misdiagnosing their true preferences based on their values. And I don't think anybody wants to make a misdiagnosis. I think, I think, I think that's, that, 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 that's great, David. Actually, you, you made us think a lot today about, about all those kinds of things. In, in the interest of time, we'll, we'll get it down there because they, I have many more questions now that at the beginning of it, to be honest. <laughs> We could keep going all night, but but no, I think I think that's fantastic, and I'm I'm extremely grateful that you you spent this bit of time with us and made us think about things that are very important, and we, we don't often talk about these things. You know, we 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 assume we all do the right thing, and 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 we assume they all do the same till you see somebody else and say that's not what I do. You know, uh, but that's that's fantastic. So thank you very much for being here. You are an absolute star. Thanks to Julia for sharing this and helping. And thanks to all the audience who are all very busy people, but they are here week in, week out.